Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us to the fifth in our series of webinars focused on teaching with the arts during the pandemic. My name is Rebecca Edwards. I'm the education specialist for teacher programs at the Getty Museum's education department, and I'll be your host for the webinar today. I hope you're gonna to enjoy today's program. We've included a series of tips and tools to help you put together your very own virtual museum field trip. Not just field trips to the Getty Museum, but to museums around the world. Our goal in preparing today's content was to provide tools that you could use and adapt in a variety of classroom settings. While many of you have recently returned to the classroom or to hybrid learning environments, or will be doing so soon, we anticipate that the opportunities for in-person field trips will still be limited, especially while museums are still setting limits on large group gatherings within their spaces. So as such, we anticipate that even if you're not teaching virtually, these virtual field trip tools will still come in handy in your in-person classroom as well. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few practical details for the webinar. First, you'll notice that I've turned on closed captioning for the webinar. If you prefer not to see it, you can go to your Zoom doc and select hide closed captioning. We've also put some information about how to do that in the chat. Second, I'd like to bring your attention to the Q&A window. Please feel free throughout the webinar to enter your questions and comments there. And we will leave time at the end of the webinar to share your comments and answer as many questions as we have time for. I also wanted to let you know that we'll be sharing the slides from the webinar along with a list of resources and links referenced during the presentation. We'll share the link to these files with you via the chat shortly, and we'll also include the same link in a follow-up email soon after the webinar. Lastly, we have a book giveaway this, week, this month as well. Um, we're excited to be able to offer a free copy of the Getty Museum's Handbook of the Collections to all webinar participants. I can show you an example. I don't have the latest um, edition, so yours will look a little different, um, but it's a great book that includes lots of images of objects from the Getty Collection, including paintings, photographs, sculptures, decorative arts, drawings, illuminated manuscripts, and more. Um, our hope is that you can use this book to help make it even easier to select objects to look at with your students the next time you do a DIY virtual field trip to the Getty Museum. We are able to make these books available for free thanks to a generous grant from the Genesis Inspiration Foundation. In this time of challenge, the Genesis Inspiration Foundation recognizes the difficulties that many art institutions and educators are facing and kindly offer to support this webinar through the free distribution of educational materials. I'll be sharing information at the end of the webinar about how to provide us with your mailing address if you'd like to receive your free copy of the book. Okay, so to get us started, now that we're done with housekeeping, I'd like to get a sense of your experience and your comfort level with virtual museum field trips. So I'm gonna launch a quick poll you can take a moment if your device allows you to, to answer these two questions. I'll give you about a minute or so. So I see some responses coming in, great. Okay, we have almost everybody. I'm gonna leave it on for about 10 more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. So for those of you who'd like to see what company you're in today, looks like there's a little bit of everything, but most of you haven't done a lot of virtual field trips and are looking forward to trying it. Um, it looks also like the level of comfort is primarily somewhat comfortable. So hopefully we'll do our job today and make you a little bit more comfortable. Okay, so um, now that we have an idea 
uh, a little bit more about how you're feeling about virtual field trips. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our presenters for the day. So we've got four presenters. We have Darcy Beeman Black, who some of you may have seen in prior webinars. She's an associate education specialist for teacher programs at the Getty Museum. And prior to the Getty, she worked as the youth, youth initiative coordinator at the National Ornamental Metal Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. William has been an educator at Getty since 2006, and he has worked to bring to life the museum experience for literally thousands of K through 12 students. He loves fun and games and is currently participating in a countrywide museum program called Game Change, which explores the art of play and virtual engagements with students. David Bowles is currently an educator at Getty and an informal learning specialist with over 15 years experience in the field of museum education. He has a passion for empowering museum visitors of all ages and abilities and a knack for harnessing the power of social learning. I can say that I've experienced that that's true. Madeline Ross is a tr transitional kindergarten teacher in the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District. She is keen on building global connectedness in her classroom and weaves in the arts whenever and wherever she can. So with that introduction, I'd like to go ahead and hand our virtual floor over to our first presenter, Darcy Beeman Black. Thank you, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. So uh, today we're gonna share a recipe for an easy DIY virtual field trip that can be facilitated in person or in the classroom or from home, as Rebecca mentioned. And we have separated this recipe into three sections. The first section is pre-trip planning. This is the step, much like in a recipe, where you will gather the ingredients for the field trip. The visit is where you will outline the plans for the day of the trip. You can think of this as the cooking steps of the, of the recipe. And third, we will share some ideas for how to extend learning beyond the day of the visit. So let's talk about pre-trip planning first. How are we going to prepare? First, decide on a topic or theme. Consider what supports your curriculum or learning objectives. Going back to that recipe analogy, this step is sort of like choosing what you want to cook for others to eat. You can also consider incorporating special interests of your students. What would they like to eat? Next, identify museums and objects that support the topic and learning objectives. Identifying museums and objects, objects can be done in a few ways. You could start with an image from a textbook and see where it came from, or research where similar objects are located. You could start by making a dream list of objects that fit your curriculum and search from there. If you already have objects in mind, you could follow the geographical history to determine places to visit. Some museums like the Getty have that history available. This is also the step to begin. This is also the step to be open to adjust the theme. Going back to that recipe analogy again, you may need to adjust the meal based on available ingredients or additional ideas. And lastly, revisit how the objects support learning objectives. Does it matter if they do? Maybe the priority is to just have fun. When choosing objects to virtually study with your, with your class, utilize resources on museum websites to make your workload easier. Particularly useful museum websites have collection pages organized into different areas of specialization. Here you can see the Getty collection page organized in that way. If you are looking for something specific, use the advanced search option like I've shown here on the box below. Also look for at home resources. Those are more prevalent since last year's school closures. And finally, look for education resources attached to objects. Here you can see an example from the Getty site. There are multiple views of the same object information about the object, and tabs at the bottom of the page with education resources if they are available. You will also notice other tabs where you can find geographical history of the object and related media. I also included a screenshot of the collection page for the antiquities area. 
You can find blogs, recent acquisitions, publications, and even YouTube videos about the collection here. The next few slides, I will share a few other museum websites that have great resources. The British Museum has a wonderful virtual gallery section where you can go in depth into various objects. Each gallery is curated to different topics like Egypt or Africa. Here is an example of a museum website that has 3D models of objects that you can flip around and interact with in real time. The Field Museum in Chicago has resources organized by topic and grade to make your planning easier. Another step to consider is establishing a materials list. You will revisit this step as you go. You will almost likely do this already, but as a reminder, consider access to materials, especially if students are at home still, and whether there is any student preparation needed, like preparing costumes or selecting a special Zoom background for the trip. And lastly, determine online tools. Because there are so many tools out there online, choosing ones to use can feel daunting at times. Here are some tips to work through this step. First, lean on what tools you know. Use the strengths to ease the stress. We have also included resources in the webinar material shared today. Various online tools are noted there, and we will also share a few during the webinar today. Then also start small and keep it simple. No need to complicate things unnecessarily. And finally, Utilize videos from developers for guidance. Most software has at least some level of how-to training on their site. YouTube is also a good source for help. Here are some examples of online tools. We will be mentioning these during the webinar or you'll also find some of them in the resource materials. I want to share with you one that I think is really easy to use and helpful for virtual field trip planning. Google Arts and Culture offers curated interactive experiences that you can pick up and explore with your students with little preparation. They range from exploring ancient ruins to even diving into the deep sea. If you're trying to find object in objects in specific cities, they also have museums organized in that way. They also have many 3D models that you can place into the real world with your phone camera. So if you want to know the scale of a whale, you can actually put it in your space. There are so many ways to explore in Google Arts and Culture. Here is a list of the ways to browse locations, objects, and images that will help you with your recipe. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I encourage you to explore the page. There is a lot there. And the other cool thing is that they incorporate museums from all over the world in one place and organize them together. All right, so next we're in the part of the recipe of the visit. William and David are going to split this portion for you today. William will discuss ways to enrich the overall virtual field trip experience, and David will share how to plan activities and engage students with objects during the virtual visit. First, let's hear from William on how to set the stage for a great adventure. William? Thanks so much, Darcy. That's a great idea about free trip planning. Uh, today's session has me uh, dreaming about traveling, and I love seeing new neighborhoods locally or uh, taking long distance travel as well. My portion has two questions framing it. How might we use technology to bring uh, us into contact with primary source materials and the institutions that house them, whether locally or anywhere around the globe, and then what do we do with them? From archives to libraries, museums, and institutes, the world is connected as never before. Virtual travel is at our fingertips. My work is about bringing people and art together. And maybe this is a bit philosophical, but art has a long history of making things present, which for many reasons, when they are absent. Even if remoteness uh, is with us, together togetherness 
collective virtual experiences with classes makes for authentic, enriching, shared experiences. Yes, let's make these connections with primary source materials from our neighborhoods and from far away places. Let's make it interesting and fun. Even beyond the pandemic, great community partners, even ones just across town, at times might seem, and in fact are, remote, or maybe just not on budget. These are also enriching online destinations that are accessible through digital virtual engagements. So imagine you've decided where to go. Now it's time to prep for the trip. Let's make it an adventure. A benefit of virtual is thinking near or far, thinking locally or thinking globally. The painting in the background shows um, an entrance to a popular destination in Paris at the turn of the 19th century. Paris today is a long ways away for me. For those tuning in from Los Angeles, the Getty, where this painting is housed, uh, is not too far, but the Louvre, newly opened in the time of Bois painting, uh, that would be quite the trip. Like the Louvre or the Getty, Bois Jardin Tour, this thing was the place to be seen or to see those around, and it was often visited by the artist who quite literally uh, paints himself into the scene. He's the one over there who's in what the theater might call the metaphorical fourth wall, there bespeckled and in the top hat uh, at the far right. Hey, Shout William. out to, yes. Uh, I wanted to just interrupt you for a second because we can't see you. There we go. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, sorry about that. Go ahead. Uh, there he is, bespeckled, uh, sitting at the in the top hat there at the far right. Uh, shout out to the theater teachers uh, connecting with us. Next stop, the Globe Theater, or maybe Pantages. While virtual might not literally put us there, doing things together, striking the poses, jumping into costumes, might paint ourselves into the place, content, and spirit in deep and meaningful ways. Wai's adventure was right down the street. Let's be inspired to expand our adventures on the internet superhighway. How about choosing a virtual background? Some of the most enthusiastic teachers who have been signing up for our Getty virtual field trips have been uploading Getty virtual backgrounds like mine. Some are using their own photographs to do so. This is personalized. Students can do this before a field trip too. You can literally knit yourself into the fabric of the place with the background you choose. What will be your place, inside or outside, next to the dinosaur skeleton or floating above an archeological site? We'll see a floating perspective with my co-presenter, Madeline, in a little while. Uh, no matter the place that you're visiting virtually, marketing teams from institutions all around the world have shared content on the web. Find it on Instagram, Google, you name it. Choose something that intrigues you, but more importantly, reflect on the choices that you've made. Why did you choose that virtual background for the day of your field trip? On the right is a photograph from Felice Beato, which uh, traveled the world and recorded a diversity of scenes, including this one of musicians in Japan. I, I didn't think I pointed this out earlier, but there was a child in the Paris painting playing a hurdy-gurdy uh, in the crowd. And uh, music is a thread that I have uh, woven into this presentation. Uh, Beato's uh, and the history of photography tells a story of increasing portability and adaptability. And I am mindful of the advances in photography that allow us to have new access to primary source materials anywhere around the world. I also thought it would be fun if um, personal or maybe a bit surreal, for the juxtaposition of these musicians paired with the beauty of St. Bavos uh, in Harlem, the Netherlands. It's still on my bucket list to um, travel to mainland Europe, uh, but I imagine floating uh, within the space of that um, site, all the great music in that magnificent building. And can you imagine uh, having that as your set of walls around you in your virtual Zoom background? The photographer's conceit reminds me to be playful. Make arrangements to put yourself there. And let's see what's next. Let's pull that musical thread through to the next concept. We have virtual backgrounds. How about adding music to the mix? Uh, when preparing today, I had uh, the wheels on the bus in my mind, uh, the song that sprang to mind thinking about those interstitials that are missing when the destination is just a mere click away. 
It feels like an accordion that is too restricted when it's fully closed. Let's open up the accordion. What else might you pack? Imaginatively, uh, I might bring that music stand like this one. Uh, build activities like singing on the bus back in. I would be singing today, but my family respectfully asked me not to. So uh, you might actually even dress the part. The, the painting on the other side has me thinking about uh, a fifth grade class that recently connected with us and was wearing red, even on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, wearing shirts that are spirited will be a great way to unify in spirit. Do you have a particular outfit to wear? If not, come as you are. The frolicking dancers also in the background remind me of dancing that has happened in the virtual realm. Shout out to all the performing arts teachers and Anna who uh, brought lively dance into the homes of children and introduced music from the 18th century. If yours is a predominantly outdoor virtual excursion, maybe it means wearing hats for that experience, even if hats are not permissible usually in your school. Maybe your students playlists uh, would prefer BTS or Dua Lipa, Olivia Rodrigo for their bus rides, for their da dance breaks exercises. Remember, make it an adventure, belt out those songs, dress the part, and move your bodies. I often begin my sessions online with teachers and students by saying, today we'll be doing activities that are probably a lot like ones you do in the classroom already. I like to make everyone feel comfortable. We'll make some observations, we'll ask questions, we'll think about the things that we're seeing, and we'll do some fun activities, some exercises. I share this because you are the best person equipped to customize your learning experience for your students. Remember that music stand. It was something that was adjustable. It can move up or down, seated or standing musicians could use it. Maybe the playlist has turned ancient and the seated harp player is what we're looking at. The harp player featured on a recent trip um, that we made and we had a great getaway to the Cyclades using Google Earth. And that's just earth.google.com. Um, and then you can just put in your school address and a site anywhere in the world. Shout out to Megan, who is a great uh, favorite fellow travel planner with me. Imagine making it a virtual Mediterranean trip. Preparing for my time in the Cyclades, I planned on stopping at our art museum to see an artwork just like that harp player. But also I set aside some time to um, stop at their favorite um, olive museum. I wasn't pressed for time. Do side trips make sense for your school's virtual field trip? How might you expand your students' experience and make integrated curricular connections? To continue the ancient storyline on this um, image, the, the background is of the ancient and well-worn paths leading up to Stonehenge. William Turner of Oxford uh, would travel to that site from a local destination, but the record of place is easily transmissible. Drawings can travel. Place is translated into drawing, affording an armchair travel, a like experience. The digital world has made it so many of our experiences are like armchair travelers, but group expressions of these experiences means sharing in the being there, which makes them all the more memorable. Yes, many paths lead to Stonehenge. Take your time and discern which paths are most fruitful for your students to do together. Virtually means um, thinking near or far, thinking locally and globally. Here we are back again at the painting of Wally's Paris. Digital paths can be circuitous uh, in ways that we are walking through the museum may not be. And there is our hurdy-gurdy player right there at the center. Um, for Boyi, it was just a mere walk through the neighborhood uh, to get to this location. But ships could have carried one far from France. In America, Robert Fulton's new steamboats were invented in 1805, not far off from 1812 of this painting. Today, we move across wide terrains on cars and buses. Boyi would have made his way through the town on horses and carriages. Students don't have, uh, they don't drive the carriages. So maybe do we in, uh, invite chaperones to join in the field trip? Having guests join you adds to the specialness of the day. Movement into the air in 1812 Paris would have been through the, well, the recent inventions, hot air balloons. It's still about a hundred years until we see the flight in the form of airplanes. Yes, 
book plane fares for your DIY field trip, bring your flat Stanleys along. These are all-inclusive travel plans at no budget prices. Flat Stanleys fold right in. You supply the capes and your students, the young explorers, these young artists, these dreamers, give them the ability to fly site to site like superheroes. I began my presentation with a sense of wanderlust. Remember to build on great experiences you've had on field trips. These are the places with many points of interest. Within memories, we can begin to draw out how experience is holistic. Can students help to discover and define the points of interest? It might be your memory of a concert in the music hall, in a courtyard, in a library's garden that inspires you to inspire others. It could be a cafe treat. The Getty's French fries are legendary. It must be that Getty oil. Or maybe it's a trip to the bookstore. Who hasn't picked up a favorite postcard after a field trip? Souvenirs do you buy or make will make lasting memories. All of these experiences have curricular connections from imaginatively budgeting, travel, to storytelling, personal narrative development, health, and wellness. Being with primary sources is exciting and fun. And there are ways to translate the experience in meaningful and fun ways virtually. I like to say your imagination is more powerful than any form of transportation. Have fun planning your adventures. And to Rebecca and the whole cast and crew, thank you so much for producing this webinar. I look forward to hearing from my fellow presenters. Awesome, thank you, William. All right, so now I am going to invite David for his part. Now that William has shared how to set the stage for an adventure and ideas for enriching the experience, uh, David will now share how to plan activities and engage students with objects during the visit. All right. Sure will. David. Thank you, Darcy. And hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Um, I'm excited to share some effective strategies with you that can help students engage authentically with objects during your virtual field trips. I'm going to start with some goals for student engagement to help guide our thinking. And then I'm gonna show you exactly what some of these goals might look like in practice. Um, I think in order to make a virtual field trip a success, it's really helpful to focus on what your students should be able to do. This is far more helpful than getting mired in what they can't do. And you know, as William said, I, I think it's great to think back to real world field trips in the before times and to think about what aspects of those trips you remember fondly. What made them matter to you? What made them matter to your students? These four goals I find very helpful in helping me articulate why field trips matter and how I can do my best to help my students get the most out of them. On any easy DIY virtual museum field trip, students should be able to one, examine high res images of primary resources at a relaxed pace. Two, they should be able to explore and discuss these objects in lively and unexpected ways together. Three, they should be able to develop informed interpretations based on visual evidence. And four, they should be able to discover, they should be able to share those discoveries in a variety of different ways. Some activity examples may suit some classrooms over others, but the hope here is that this presentation includes something for everyone. Also that the strategies shared will inspire some new ideas and new activities that will fit the needs of your students. So to think about that first goal, students should be able to examine high res images of primary resources at a relaxed pace. Museum websites vary wildly. I strongly recommend taking some time to explore them in advance. Digitizing a museum's collection takes tremendous time and resources. And just because a museum is nearby or familiar does not mean that its website is going to support your virtual field trip to its fullest potential. There is a chance to branch out here. We've talked a lot about that, especially the way William captured that energy of wanderlust. Bigger and encyclopedic museums may offer new and unexpected opportunities, 
especially because they're able to have great high-res images of their collection freely available. Check out the Metropolitan Museum of Art or the Art Institute of Chicago to see what I mean. And I'm also thinking here of Darcy's uh, resources at the British Museum and the Field Museum. Um, it's really great to get out there and see what they're up to. Focus on a few well-chosen objects rather than trying to see it all. You can easily extend the virtual field trip with some self-directed learning, and I know Madeline's going to explore that next. But for your group experience, it'll be more successful to explore a few things very well rather than overextending yourselves. Be sure each object that you focus on offers something new for students to consider. If you're using a theme to guide your, your conversation, uh, you might ask yourself how the object you're choosing is going to advance things while enhancing the overall theme. Be sure no two objects that you choose hit the same notes or things might start to feel a little repetitive. A stitch in time saves nine, I've heard. Take the time to set the tone before you get things started. This field trip is not going to be business as usual, and you can send the right messages by signaling your excitement and, and hope for a positive experience. And last but not least, as you know, students often achieve what is expected of them for better and for worse. So set the bar high. Field trips are a chance for students to be different. And this is a great chance to embrace that. So thinking about our second goal, students should be able to explore and discuss objects in lively and unexpected ways together. This is an interesting one. Studies show that stress and anxiety impede higher level thinking. So let's do all we can to clear them out of this kind of experience. Um, a few deep breaths together at the start of an experience or perhaps approaching a transition can calm groups' nerves and help make those transitions more smooth. Along those lines, another key aspect to making room for students to observe at a relaxed pace is not calling on the first hands that pop up. Tell students that you're going to look closely together for a few moments before the group discussion and then actually do it. Resist the temptation to call on those first raised hands. There's no prize for first place. Uh, instead, this is all about slow looking and deep thinking. So show students that you're valuing that close looking over fast thinking. Active listening is so important on virtual field trips, maybe even more so than in person field trips. Think of ways you can show students that you're listening to them. One easy one way is to zoom in on specific details as they come up if you're working with a high enough resolution image that allows that. If you do that, be sure to always zoom back out to the full image though, so that you're making sure that other parts of the work of art or object under inspection can be discussed. We all use questions in some way or another when we teach. On a virtual field trip, I strongly recommend questions that probe students' perceptions and sensations rather than their data recall. Don't worry about hammering in curriculum connections in the moment. They'll come naturally if your objects are well chosen. Instead, asking questions, instead of asking questions that you already know the answer to, like what is this made of or where is this from, try questions that model your curiosity about your students' perceptions, like what details are catching your eye or what do you think this might feel like if we could touch it? And lastly, don't worry about knowing everything about your objects. It's impossible. Don't let perfection be the enemy of good. Focus on the process of discovery and exploration. When students inevitably ask you a question you can't answer, tell them you don't know, and then try finding out why they're curious, what it is about the object that inspired their question. Thinking of our third goal, things get trickier now as we try to make room for students to make informed interpretations based on visual evidence. There are a couple different ways this can work, and no two educators do it the same way. As the discussion unfolds, it can be hard to know where and how to share information about your object. I recommend folding in small, relevant bits of information as you respond to students' observations. This can prevent the experience of the, the data dump. Here's all the information you need to know all at once and ensure that the process of exploration isn't brought to a premature end. Nothing shuts down curiosity like too much information. If you have a key fact about the object that you want students to know, I recommend simply telling them about it and then asking them if they see visual evidence to support the idea. This can be a lot more successful than guess what I'm thinking questions. For example, consider the difference between one, telling students that an object is 500 years old 
and then asking them if they see evidence to support that. And two, asking students how old they think an object is. Lastly, it's really important that, to remember that students bring their entire lives with them. We all do. And object-based learning is personal and very non-linear. So I encourage you to be really open to connections you do not anticipate. The last goal is really thinking about ways students can share their discoveries with one another. I encourage you to expect the unexpected. Virtual field trips can be opportunities for students to shine, especially ones who may struggle in other aspects of their school life. Whenever possible, I recommend offering students choices within a structure. For example, if you're asking students to model their learning, give them a few choices of format. Students could certainly write about their experiences just as well as they could draw them, or maybe even produce a short play about them or create an online interactive about them. The differences between divergent and convergent learning can become really clear on field trips. And I recommend an openness to different and different and even conflicting interpretations of the objects. And lastly, you know, sharing discovery should be all about student voices. This is a great opportunity for students to practice new vocabulary and new ways of thinking and sharing. So what does this all look like? Well, let's take a look at two possibilities, one of them very simple and the other a little more extended. The Getty's 30 second look activity is great low hanging fruit for anyone who's looking for a way into this kind of thing. Works of art are natural vocabulary builders. The strategy is simple. Ask students to speculate on how much time they think they might spend on average looking at an object in a museum, like this painting. Record their responses and discuss the factors they believe affect the amount of time they spend looking. After students have answered, explain that the average amount of time that people spend looking at an object in a museum is less than half a minute. Do they think that's enough? Finally, share your screen and direct students to look at a work of art on Zoom together for 30 seconds, like we have just been doing now. At the 30 second mark, stop sharing your screen. And without looking back at the work of art, ask students questions to probe their memories about their observations. What do they remember? What do they describe about the person in the painting? What do they remember about their faces? What kind of clothing is the person wearing and so forth? There's a whole range of different questions you can ask that can reopen a painting and help students become more mindful of the ways that they are looking at works of art. Another more complex way of helping a group on a virtual field trip is drawing together. Drawing together on Zoom can help students slow down, look carefully and develop really interesting new vocabulary. For example, looking at this ancient Roman mosaic, you might give students two minutes or so to simply draw what they see. I recommend joining them. Do it yourself. At the two minute mark, ask everyone to hold up what they've got at the cameras and see where discussions take you from there. Alternatively, you might ask students to focus on, say, geometry and ask them to sketch circles, quadrilaterals, hexagons, and other shapes that they see in this form. Don't worry about the details, go for the forms. Again, see where that takes a group. Another approach could be blind contour drawing, which involves drawing without looking down at your paper and without lifting up your pen or pencil as you go. There's a lot of different ways this could go and I'm excited to see what kind of post-visit activities you can explore as well. So thanks for your time and energy. I hope these ideas sparked some fresh thinking. I'm gonna hand the baton back to Darcy now, who's gonna take us to our next presenter. Awesome, thank you. And I am actually going to share a bit first about post-visit activities. Uh, very quickly before we introduce Madeline. So now that we have prepped and cooked our recipe, uh, let's go over a few post-visit activities and projects that can extend learning and help students to further process the experience. So how will you build on the experience with your students? I have a few ideas. They range greatly because it really depends on the experience, what you'd be able to do. But some ideas include close look at in a new context. 
Choose a new object and practice close looking. It can be a related object or totally unrelated. You can sketch the same object again, revisit that object. What new things did, have they noticed? Have your students noticed? Uh, bring your story up to date. Maybe you were looking at a portrait and you could follow the story after the portrait was made or when the age of the subject in the portrait. You could continue the story with a new object. Uh, can you find any other objects that relate? Maybe students can find those objects. And then also make your own. Uh, maybe you looked at Abe Lincoln's top hat on your trip and you could have students design their own iconic hat look. Uh, you could track the history of the object on Google Earth. Madeline will share a bit about this in a minute. Uh, sketch from imagination. I'm going to share an example of that in a second. And explore contemporary connections. For example, how would an ancient culture survive today? Or based on what you've seen, how would their customs or food look if they were alive today? What kind of food would they like? And then I'm going to share a post visit activity revisiting the uh, dinosaur bone or skeletons. So here's an example of an activity where you could take an image from maybe a virtual trip. So I actually took this image from the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. I just took a screenshot from their virtual online tour. And you could have your students choose an animal skeleton or a dinosaur or a fossil, and they can draw what they think it would look like if it were alive. And you could also have them draw the habitat around it based on things that they learned about the trip. Um, and I feel like this activity could be for all grades, older or younger. Um, so now I want to give Madeline some time to speak before we run out of time. Uh, so I'm going to now invite Madeline to share another post visit activity. All right, so take it away, Madeline. Thank you. So I'm a transitional kindergarten teacher and I was lucky enough to go on a Getty virtual field trip in November with my students and we weren't ready to finish our field trip at the end. We loved it so much. So I thought of ways that I could extend it back into the classroom so that we could continue learning in a similar way that we did on our field trip. So during our field trip, we took a look at this statuette of a lion, which is a piece that's part of the Getty collection. And after the field trip, we turned the statuette of the lion into the main character of a shared writing piece. And this allowed for a shared experience for all students, curricular connections, and just creative, innovative thinking that I'll discuss some more in a few slides. So the first thing that I did was I went to the Getty website and through their collections page, they have all of the images of the works that are at the Getty. So I located the image that we looked at and I used a website to remove the background so that I could then place this lion into different environments. And in the resources, folder that you'll have access to. I've made a one page sheet that explains exactly how I did this so that you could do it too. So I started by placing the lion in a jungle, which I felt was a uh, not such a crazy concept for the kids before letting them get silly and really creative with it. And then every child in the class working in small groups had the opportunity to place the lion within their own environment. So it started in the jungle, then it moved to the ocean and one child wanted to put the lion in a fancy hotel. The lion went to outer space and I added a space helmet over it at the beach. And then some of the students wanted to bring the lion into their own environment. So this student wanted the lion to be in his mouth and in his ear, which inspired another student to put the lion in his hair. So we just had a lot of fun with it. The kids really enjoyed it. And they were able to have this collective book together, which was a special experience. So as I was saying, it provided a shared experience when 
the learning opportunities have been so disjointed. Some students are in a learning center, some are at home, some are at a grandparent's house. So to provide them with this shared experience was really special. We all had the shared experience at the Getty and then we all were able to create this writing piece out of it. It also was able to connect to our uh, writing standards and writing curriculum. And it just allowed for creative, innovative thinking. And it was coming from the children, which I thought was the most powerful part. So I wasn't directing them with where to put their lion, but they were able to activate their creativity. Some other activities we did, we really enjoyed the 30 second look. So we've used the 30 second look in other contexts. So we use closer look glasses or our 30 second look glasses to really get a close look for 30 seconds. And here we used it um, in a page of a read aloud. So they just took 30 seconds and we talked about what do you notice? What materials did they use? What details can you see? And then mentioned earlier was we used Google Earth to look at the Getty and the Getty Villa before our visit. So we talked about how the art inside of the Getty and the Getty Villa aren't the only important things, but the architecture itself is an art form. And we took a 30 second look at the architecture and what we saw, what we noticed. We even talked about how the art might need to be conserved in different ways in a coastal environment or a mountain environment. And that's it from me. Thank you so much, Madeline. Um, okay, so now we'd like to use the last few minutes of our webinar um, to field any questions from um, participants. Um, if you haven't already, you're welcome to enter your questions into the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your doc or um, well, it depends on what device you're on, but most likely in the bottom of your doc. Um, and I, I don't right now see any questions, so we'll give it just a minute to see if anybody has um, anything you'd like to know. Um, and in the meantime, I'd like to share with you um, some information about what is included in the resource folder today, um, and also share with you um, some of the things that we'll be adding in the coming days. So the resource folder includes a planning template um, that follows along the um, recipe that Darcy presented. Um, and it's a easy fill it in template that you can use. It's in Google Doc. Um, so you can use it to kind of track your notes of objects that you'd like to look at during your field trip um, or places that you'd like to visit. Um, we also included a sample um, field trip plan using that template already filled up, filled out. Um, it is a field trip that's geared for middle school um, that focuses on ancient Egypt, but we'll be adding additional sample field trips to the folder in the coming days. Um, we'll send out a notice um, soon after this webinar to those of you who are in attendance with information about what those sample field trips will include. Um, so now it looks like we do have some questions. So we'll go ahead and invite presenters to turn their cameras on. Um, so uh, one question that we, we had, um, and I might direct this one to Madeline, um, is there, there is a question about whether there's any ideas for virtual farm field trips for kindergarten. And I'm not sure if you've had to think about that, but since you work with that age, I thought I would pose the question to you. There actually are quite a few farm field trips that are live led by people who are living or working on farms. So a Google search can sometimes come up with some, or if there's a particular um, field trip that, or a particular farm that you're interested in visiting, you can also go to virtualfarmtrips.com to use, uh, um, to find field trips. And Airbnb Experience also has some great virtual 
field trip opportunities. My class went to a farm in New Zealand, which was really fun. Thanks, Madeline. Um, okay, so then I have a question for David. Um, I know that you had other ideas and were um, whittling down your presentation, um, but there's a question about whether you could share other ideas for engaging with objects in addition to the 30 second book. Oh gosh, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I ended up focusing in this presentation just on sort of simple things with very few materials. Even beyond that though, there are movement activities that we didn't even branch into at all. Um, in the low hanging fruit category, I might include tableau vivant work. So like getting up and moving your body into a pose that you actually see in a work of art. Um, students can work in small groups to play with that on Zoom. Um, I've seen it work really well in full groups. As far as a more complicated movement would go, I think it's always interesting to find whatever you're doing, to find ways to probe students' thinking. So being really curious about what is happening in their heads as they're working with those works of art. Um, I'm reminded specifically of a student recently during a drawing activity who after the drawing activity ended, she continued to elaborate on the drawing she was going in much the way that Madeline was describing her students. Once they took an idea and started running with it, she did the same thing and she ended up turning what started out as a simple sketch into a much more complex work of art that explained her thinking about before, during, and after the scene that we were seeing in the painting. So I guess my muddled answer is anything that a student has created along the way of a field trip can be exponentially expanded um, through their own interests and through their own dialogues. Thanks, David. Um, so um, another question that we have, um, I'm not sure if we can answer it in this format, but I'll direct it to Darcy in case you can offer any tips. Um, there's a question about um, wanting to figure out uh, how, what are some strategies for making choices about what places you might visit on your field trip, um, either for looking through the Getty website and picking objects or for choosing other objects for your field trip? Well, I think some of it has to do with what you, you know, want to feed the table, so to speak. So what kind of recipe do your students want? I mean, you could make it, like I mentioned earlier, something fun. Maybe they mentioned something sort of riffing off of David's idea of really pulling from their thoughts uh maybe you could maybe take notes of things that they mentioned things that they're curious about curious about uh during discussions in other lessons and you could pull from that that might be a good direction to go uh i did mention google arts and culture and the reason i mentioned that was because there are a lot of ways to take one theme or topic or idea and translate it to many different locations and many different museums, a lot of different objects. I mean, there is the choice, like maybe you look at all green objects and they're all over the world. Um, so I think it really, um, it depends on, you know, what you wanna cook for the family, so to speak. <laughs> Let that lead you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Darcy. Um, so I think with that, we will um, wrap up the Q&A. Um, if you have any last minute questions, um, we'll try and answer, there are a few we'll answer privately. Um, so, um, to, uh, so thank you all of the presenters for joining us today. Um, we will um, look forward to reviewing some of the materials that you've shared in the slides that you've shared in the resource folder. Thank you for having us. Okay, so um, just to, to circle back regarding the resource folder, um, we also have included in there, Madeline provided us a some written instructions um, about how to insert images into Google Slides in the way that she was doing in the example that she shared. So you can find that information there. Um, David also shared some information about drawing with an object, um, which you can find the re in the resource folder. Um, and I believe um, 
The resource folder also includes a, a, a list of some really good museum websites to start with um, in your hunt for where you would like to go on your virtual field trip. Um, and last but not least, we have a list of the objects that the works of art and links to where you can find them um, that were included in today's presentation. Um, so to, to close things out, um, I'd like to share with you what's coming up in the way of teacher webinars from the Getty. Um, the next in this series of art and teaching in the time of coronavirus um, is on April 21st. Um, it's focused on incorporating movement and play into your teaching, both in the virtual and in-person classroom using arts. Um, so we hope that'll be really exciting and we hope you'll join us again for that webinar. Um, additionally, we are launching and will be sending out registration links soon um, for a new webinar called Getty Unshuttered, Introduction to Youth-Focused Photography Resources. Um, and that will introduce especially for middle and high school teachers, um, information about our photography resources um, and lessons and materials that we've published on YouTube that we think can be useful for teaching across a variety of subject areas. Um, you'll receive a registration link for that webinar in your follow-up email from this webinar. Um, so last but not least, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, we have we love your thoughts your ideas your suggestions so feel free to reach out to us via our teacher programs email address at the bottom of this slide um, let us know topics you'd like to hear us cover um, suggestions you have for us and um, we'd love to hear it all we'd also appreciate your feedback on this webinar via the survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of the webinar that is if you access the meeting via your browser if you're using the app, it may not pop up. That's why we also have included the link to the survey in the chat. Um, it's only a few questions, several of which are op optional and very quick to fill out. Additionally, when you complete the survey, you'll get a link at the end of the survey on the confirmation message that takes you to a form where you can provide us with your mailing address if you'd like to receive a free copy of the Getty collection, handbook of the collection, this book that I talked about earlier. So again, if you'd like to receive a free copy of our Getty handbook of the collections, um, once you complete the survey on your co submission confirmation message, you'll get a pop-up that, or not a pop-up, but a link rather um, with, the, with a form where you can provide us with your mailing address. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We really admire and appreciate all of the amazing work that you do. Um, and we wanna just thank you for being amazing teachers. We look forward to seeing you again soon.